I'm Liz Faubles, and this is Currents. The Supreme Court upholds the centerpiece of the Affordable Care Act. We'll have all the reaction. Good evening and thank you for joining us. A landmark decision and a historical day. We begin tonight's newscast with the Supreme Court ruling heard around the nation. The U.S. Supreme Court today voted to uphold President Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act as constitutional. In a 5-4 decision, the High Court found the individual mandate at the heart of the law was a congressional tax. Now, what does that mean? Well, that says that Congress has the power under this provision to make Americans carry insurance or pay a penalty. Chief Justice John Roberts, seen as a conservative, turned out to be the swing vote in this decision. Roberts wrote the opinion for the majority that the mandate may be upheld as within Congress's power to, quote, lay and collect taxes. Well, shortly after the decision was handed down, President Obama addressed the nation, explaining why the Affordable Health Care Act is so important. If you're one of the more than 250 million Americans who already have health insurance, you will keep your health insurance. This law will only make it more secure and more affordable. Insurance companies can no longer impose lifetime limits on the amount of care you receive. They can no longer discriminate against children with pre-existing conditions. They can no longer drop your coverage if you get sick. They can no longer jack up your premiums without reason. They are required to provide free preventive care like checkups and mammograms a provision that's already helped 54 million Americans with private insurance. And by this August, nearly 13 million of you will receive a rebate from your insurance company because it spent too much on things like administrative costs and CEO bonuses and not enough on your health care. Okay, so what does this mean for the issue that has clearly dominated the attention of U.S. bishops and Catholics across the country? The issue that was the catalyst for the Fortnight for Freedom. That, of course, the profound concern that a separate mandate treads upon religious liberties. That mandate, announced earlier this year, would force most religious organizations to provide contraception, sterilization, and abortion-inducing drugs in their employee health plans. Well, suffice it to say, the fight for freedom continues in earnest. In a statement issued by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the decision of the Supreme Court neither diminishes the moral imperative to ensure decent health care for all, nor eliminates the need to correct the fundamental flaws described above. We therefore continue to urge Congress to pass and the administration to sign legislation to fix those flaws. And this from the Catholic Association. With this ruling, people of faith will now be forced to either pay crippling fines or violate their deeply held religious beliefs. It is more critical than ever for Catholics to mobilize in defense of our Catholic schools, hospitals, and charities, and our First Amendment right to religious liberty. We need to fight in the court of public opinion, in Congress, now and in the election campaign in November. And there are also other implications to consider, according to Susan B. Anthony List. The organization says, quote, by confirming Obamacare, they handed Obama a key win while ensuring that Planned Parenthood and their abortion allies will receive billions more in taxpayer funding to expand their abortion empire. Now, we understand there are a lot of moving parts in today's news and also a great deal to digest. So earlier I spoke with Mark Rienzi of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, the law firm on the front lines of legal challenges to the administration's contraception mandate. The firm is representing a number of clients in high-profile lawsuits. Mark helped put the decision and what this means for religious liberty in perspective. All right, now, Mark, this health care law, 1,000 pages long, passed about two years ago, and it certainly has been a lot to digest in that time. Today, of course, we're concerned with one major part, the heart of it, the high court upholding the individual mandate, five to four decision based on congressional tax writing provisions. Walk us through that. What exactly does that mean? Sure. What it means is that the court said Congress had the power to pass the statute. Under the Constitution, Congress has limited enumerated powers. They can't do anything they think is right. They have to do things that fit within the powers that the Constitution gives them. And this case was simply about the question, does passing the health care law fall within 
one of those powers, and the court narrowly answered it today that it can be viewed as within the courts, within Congress's taxing power to pass the individual mandate. Okay, and Republican Congresswoman Michelle Bachman actually raised the point that this decision, based on what you just said, means that Congress can now purchase any product, any service, and determine the price. Now, in view of this opinion, and I should mention this is an analysis of an opponent of this law, does this present another scenario where we can see yet another branch of the government exercise an overreach? Absolutely, and, and, and there, there are two things uh, to make clear about the opinion. One is the court was simply deciding did Congress have the power to pass the law, but they, they did not decide the core religious liberty issue, which is this forcing people to buy contraceptives and abortion-inducing drugs under the law mm -hmm. uh, violate religious freedom rights. And actually, if you look at the opinion, both the majority and even Justice Ginsburg's opinion for the four justices usually thought of on the left, those opinions all agree that even if the law itself is constitutional, uh, things that are done under the law may well be unconstitutional. So this is what Justice Ginsburg said. A mandate to purchase a particular product would be unconstitutional for if, for example, the edict impermissibly abridged the freedom of speech or interfered with the free exercise of religion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly what the next cases are all about. So this case says Congress has the power to pass the law. The next cases are really about, okay, are there particular things in this law which force people to violate their religion. Those cases all still go forward. Okay, and I'm, and I'm so happy you brought that up because I know, and, and of course, you know, most of our viewers know that the Beckett Fund has been on the ground with this from the very beginning. You filed the first three lawsuits challenging this mandate. We've seen 26 states sue over the law, arguing that the individual mandate re requiring people to buy this health insurance despite their beliefs or face a fine in 2014 was un unconstitutional. So you say these lawsuits will continue, but they just take on a different kind of face. Well, they... They raise an issue that the Supreme Court just didn't touch today. All the court touched today was the reach of Congress's power. What they didn't address is whether Congress's exercise of that power interfered with any other individual protected liberty, namely the, the freedom of religion. Mm -hmm. So the administration survived one legal challenge today, okay. uh, but there are 23 more with 50-something plaintiffs staring them in the face, mm -hmm. and all of those cases are permitted to go forward today. And again, even, the, even Justice Ginsburg's opinion expressly says that even though Congress can do something under its taxing power, doesn't mean that they're allowed to run roughshod over the other protections in the Constitution. And in fact, we fully expect that when courts look at it, they will find that, that Congress and HHS can't do what, what HHS is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Mark, you at Beckett Fund held a conference call immediately following the ruling. What were some of the biggest concerns from your clients? Um, well, it wasn't, a, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a conference call with clients. It was a conference call with uh, members of the press. And, and the concerns we heard were people trying to sort out how does this lawsuit affect the religious liberty lawsuits, um, what's, the, what's the likely timing, and th those, are, those are natural questions. And, and I'll just repeat for your audience what we said there, which is the decision by the Supreme Court today does not affect the religious liberty challenges. It doesn't say that the law is okay in any broad sense. It says that Congress had the power to pass it. Uh, that really sets the table for the rest of the challenges to go forward. Uh, and the court seems quite clearly open to the fact that Congress may have the power to enact the law, but that sometimes it will violate religious liberty. Take an easy example. If Congress passed a tax and the tax says anyone who goes to Catholic Mass has to pay a $5 tax, well, would that be within Congress's taxing power? Sure, Congress has the power to tax. But it would be a very different analysis once you get to the religious freedom challenge of doesn't that infringe the religious freedom of Catholics? Of course it mm -hmm. does. So um, we really only answered the threshold question today, and it just does, it didn't get to the religion questions. Those are coming next. Okay, Mark, in his address today, President Obama, following the decision, listed several reasons why the Affordable Health Care Act makes sense. He says, if you have insurance, you get to keep insurance. If you don't, state-by-state -state efforts will be made to craft a plan that can work with you. He also stated that insurance companies cannot discriminate if you have pre-existing conditions or jack up premiums. I want to clarify with you and other opponents of the health care reform law, the effectiveness or necessity of these provisions are not what's in dispute, correct? Absolutely, and to be clear, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the Beckett Fund is an opponent of the health care law. The Beckett Fund is in favor of protecting people's individual liberty, and we stand up whenever anybody's religious liberty is threatened or challenged. So we're not, we, we don't have any particular position on the health care law, on, on nationalized health care, or anything like that. We have a position on religious liberty, and in this particular case, we, we're, not, we're not challenging covering children until they're 26. We're not challenging... Um, 
guaranteed issue for people with, with pre-existing conditions. None of that has anything to do with the HHS mandate lawsuits. Those lawsuits only concern the religious freedom issue. Can the government force you to purchase services that violate your religion? Federal law is actually very clear that they can't do that, mm -hmm. and that's, that's the only thing that we're challenging. Okay, Mark, and I also want to reiterate that much of this law is not even going to go into effect until 2014, so I have to ask, is there still time to overhaul the overhaul, and will we see the usual suspects in Washington? Will we see law firms like Beckett? And, of course, our U.S. bishops continue their call to repeal this law? I think so. I mean, one of the things Chief Justice Roberts said in his opinion was that the court does not sit there to correct or to protect people from the political consequences of their political choices. Um, I think in some sense he was signaling to the American people, hey, if you realize this is a bad law, you have to fix it. You have to vote people in who will change it. You can't look at us to fix it. And look, ultimately, maybe there will be a political fix. There hasn't been one yet. Uh, we're in the business of litigating cases, so we're going to keep going litigating cases, and, and, and we're going to trust in the Constitution and the law to, to protect our clients' rights. And one other thing, just to be clear, um, some provisions don't take effect till 2014. Let me tell you one that takes effect in about a month and a half. As of August 1, 2012, every private employer in the country, beginning with their first plan year that starts after that date, will have to pay for contraceptives, sterilization, and drugs and devices that cause early abortions. So that piece of it goes into effect. Unless you're a nonprofit, you have a little more time. But if you are a for-profit, if you, if you run a business for a living, if you go out to make money for a living, you have to start buying those products for your employees with your first plan that starts after this August 1st. So it's not just some distant future threat to religious liberty. It's real, and it's right here, and that's why it needs to be challenged right now. And, Mark, having said that, you put th those details out there. The opinion today has us dissecting so many other details now. There's a lot that maybe people did not know about that they're becoming aware of now. Do you think we will see more opposition to this law increase based on that? I think there's some possibility of that. I think there's some possibility that some people may have thought, oh, the Supreme Court will bail us out. And now it's clear the Supreme Court is not bailing anybody out of, of the law as a whole. So if people realize, hey, this law puts power in the hands of government officials that is, that is a dangerous amount of power, then people are going to have to you know, use the political system or use litigation to fix that. All right, Mark Rienzi with the Beckett Fund, thank you so much for putting all this in perspective. We really appreciate your taking the time to join us today. Thanks very much for having me. You're very welcome. And be sure to stay with Currents for more on the Supreme Court's decision. On Friday, we will get reaction from Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarcio. But stay with us. There's more Currents ahead. An update on the status of a prominent pro-life activist priest. That and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Liz Fawbliss. There is still no clear answer following a Vatican decision on a prominent pro-life priest. Priest for Life President Father Frank Pavone of the Diocese of Amarillo, Texas, says the Vatican has declared him a priest in good standing. Amarillo Bishop Patrick Zurich suspended Pavone from ministering outside his diocese last year. Now, in his own statement, Bishop Zurich acknowledged the Vatican's decision, but said Father Pavone was to continue his assignment as chaplain to a religious community in Texas. Texas. The bishop also stated that he would, quote, as a gesture of goodwill, grant Father Pavone permission in individual cases to participate in pro-life events. Elsewhere in Texas, a new mother took a sign outside a Catholic church to heart. She left her newborn baby girl in a shoebox on the steps of St. Joseph Church in the town of Alice on Wednesday. The umbilical cord was still attached and doctors say the baby was probably born on Tuesday. She's currently being cared for at a hospital and police say help is available if the mother wants it. If the mother wants to come forward, she is not in trouble. We want to help her, and, and our people here in our community will be more than glad to help her in any way, in any form, and help the family members, if that is the case. And the baby will eventually be placed in foster care and put up for adoption. Catholic Charities is helping victims of wildfires in Colorado. Fire and smoke on the outskirts of Colorado Springs have forced the evacuation of over 30,000 people in the surrounding areas. The fire, which began June 23rd, has already burned over 15,000 acres. Catholic Charities is supplying food to three shelters in the town. They're also continuing to assist victims of a previous fire, the second largest 
years in Colorado history that began earlier this month. Colorado Springs Bishop Michael Sheridan offered prayers for those affected. Bishop Sheridan was also leading a holy hour of prayer on Thursday night. From China, the father of a baby that was forcibly aborted has reportedly disappeared. According to Catholic News Agency and EWTN News, the father tried to travel to Beijing last week to speak with reporters and lawyers about the abortion. He was apparently met with violent resistance, being physically assaulted. Earlier this month, the couple was forced to have an abortion because they could not afford the fine they were issued for having a second child. The Chinese government enforces a strict one-child-per-family policy. Well, from Canada, the Bishop of Calgary says a group of health care advocates are purposely misinterpreting his opposition to the HPV vaccine. In an email to the Calgary Herald, Bishop Fred Henry says the group HPV Calgary is trying to demonize those who don't agree with their approach. The Calgary Catholic Board voted to not offer the human papillomavirus vaccine in Catholic schools to girls in grades 5 through 9. One of the founders of HPV Calgary says not vaccinating children leaves them at risk. The virus is transmitted sexually and Bishop Henry says offering the vaccine only encourages sexual promiscuity. The bishop says HPV Calgary, which is made up of doctors and bioethicists, is trying to tread on religious freedom and should instead focus on alternative ways of administering the vaccine. Now, in written columns and letters to parents, he was laid out the moral objections to the vaccine and has urged abstinence before marriage. Churches in two countries are inviting soccer fans inside, and Rome Reports has that story. The European Soccer Championship has been taking place over the past month in the countries of Poland and Ukraine. The final match will be on July 1st, marking an end to the 14th European Tournament. Churches throughout Poland and Ukraine, like this one in the city of Lviv, have been opening their doors to tourists, with mass being held in German, English, Portuguese and Ukrainian. Church leaders have said it's a way of inviting fans to pray while giving them access to the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist. And finally tonight, it's the choir that sings for Pope Benedict at all his masses and on Friday it will experience a first in its 500 year history. The Sistine Chapel Choir will join forces with the choir from the Anglican Church of London's Westminster Abbey. The two choirs will sing as one ensemble at a mass for the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. It will be the first time the Sistine Chapel Choir has undertaken such a collaboration. The Westminster Abbey Choir first performed for Pope Benedict when he he visited the historic Anglican Church during his visit to the UK in 2010. It marked the first time a Pope has visited Westminster Abbey. And stay tuned, there's more Currents Ahead. When we return, an important step in the path to sainthood for a former head of Opus Dei. Welcome back. Big news on the sainthood cause for one of this country's most recognizable priests. Pope Benedict has approved the heroic virtues of Archbishop Fulton Sheen. In a decree issued by the Congregation for the Cause of Saints and signed by Pope Benedict, Archbishop Sheen was declared venerable. Sheen was probably best known as the host of the 1950s television show Life is Worth Living, still shown on religious stations across the country. The priest even twice won an Emmy for Most Outstanding Television Personality. Archbishop Sheen was more than just a TV star, though. He was also the director of the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, today known as the Congregation for the Evangelization of People, which undertakes missionary work around the world. Sheen was also known for helping a number of prominent people convert to Catholicism, including Ford Motor Company President Henry Ford II and politician Claire Booth Luce. Sheen also served as an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of New York and as Bishop of Rochester. He died in 1979. And finally tonight, if you had never heard of Opus Dei, there's a good chance the publicity surrounding the Da Vinci Code changed all that. Now, while the book and movie portrayed the group as a secret society, the real story is quite different. Opus Dei's mission to spread the message that work and the circumstances of everyday life are occasions to grow closer to God, serve others, and improve society. Spanish priest Jose Maria Escriva founded Opus Dei in 1928. Escriva was canonized in 2002, and now his successor as head of Opus Dei has moved closer to sainthood. Rome Reports has more on that. 
The Pope signed a decree that recognizes the heroic virtues of Álvaro del Portillo. He was the first successor of Saint José María Escrivá, who founded the Opus Dei. He was also his closest collaborator. This step is actually key, as his beatification process goes further. It means that Benedict XVI recognizes that Don Álvaro exemplified Christian virtues in his life. The Vatican is already analyzing a documented miracle that's attributed to the intercession of Álvaro del Portillo. If it's approved by experts, theologians, and of course the Pope, his beatification could follow. Álvaro del Portillo was born in Madrid, Spain in 1914. His mother was Mexican, his father was Spanish. He studied civil engineering, philosophy, and theology. He was one of the first members of the Opus Dei and one of Saint Escrivá's main collaborators. In fact, it was him who encouraged Portillo to become a priest. He took part in preparing the Second Vatican Council, and in that council, he also served as secretary of the Commission for the Discipline of the Clergy and Christian People. This commission issued the Presbyterorum Ordinis Decree, which deals with the role of priest. After the death of Saint José María in 1975, he was named his first successor. He led the Opus Dei for 20 years, and during that time he spread its presence to 20 new countries. He also launched social and educational programs in the Congo, Nigeria, the Philippines, Brazil, Spain, and Italy. And with that development came the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross in Rome. He died on March 23, 1994 in Rome, just days after turning 80. That same day, John Paul II, who considered him a good friend, went to pray before him. The beatification process also includes analyzing the pros and cons of his life and virtues. So far, 133 people have been interviewed. Of these, 62 are from the Opus Dei, and 71 do not belong to the prelature. Among the witnesses, there are 19 cardinals and 12 archbishops and bishops. And that is all for tonight. Now be sure to join us on Friday night as we take a close look at the Fortnight for Freedom. We'll also get Bishop DeMarcio's reaction to today's decision by the Supreme Court on the health care law. Until then, be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also follow us on Twitter and you can find us there at CurrentsNY. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Fobles. We leave you tonight with the sounds of the Sistine Chapel Choir who will perform on Friday with the Westminster Abbey Choir on the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul. Thank you for watching and have a good night. <laughs>